As you can see, the um, title of my talk is under the call of authority, terror to group violence in the law, the social dominance perspective. The thing I've been interested in, the topic I've been interested in for at least the last 25 to 30 years is the dynamics of racism and oppression, and classism, and sexism, and to try to understand why these phenomena have been so difficult to deal with and so difficult to eradicate. And in the process of trying to understand this, or these phenomena and what they have in common, I, together with one of my colleagues, um, then at uh, Stanford University, Felicia Prado, <coughs> developed this model called social dominance theory. And social dominance theory begins with a very simple observation that human social systems tend to be structured as group-based social hierarchies, with one group at the top of the social system and one or a number of other groups at the bottom of the system. And societies differ in the degree to which these uh, group differences are severe or not, or hierarchically structured or not, the degree to which they're structured thus. But what is uh, ubiquitous is the fact of hierarchy itself. It seems to be quite universal. Given this, the two most uh, basic observations that we make, or basic assumptions we make, is that since human social systems are ubiquitously hierarchical, they're probably predisposed to structure themselves in this manner. And secondly, that the common forms of social oppression that we're used to, like racism, sexism, slavery, nationalism, classism, etc., are really simply special instantiations of the tendency for human societies to form themselves in this hierarchical manner. Um, the primary goals of social dominance theory are really to try to understand the precise multi-level mechanisms which are responsible for the production and the reproduction of group-based social inequality. And one of the things that we reason is that there are two kinds of social forces which tend to keep societies in a kind of equilibrium, a hierarchical equilibrium. One of these kinds of forces are what we call hierarchy enhancing social agents or social forces. These are forces or agents which produce greater and greater levels of social inequality and hierarchy. Countering these dominance driving phenomena, what we call social hierarchy attenuating social agents, and these are social agents which produce greater and greater levels of equality. And the balance between these two sets of forces are one of the sets of systems which produce a certain amount of stability uh, in social inequality in a society at any given time. And by these social agents, we mean things like socio-political ideology. For instance, we can think of uh, hierarchy enhancing or he ideology such as fascism, racism, sexism, classism, capitalism. And opposed to that, hierarchy attenuating ideology such as the universal rights of man, socialism, uh, and social democracy as ideological agents, he and on. We also have in this system social stereotypes, social customs, social institutions which all play a role. Examples of hierarchy enhancing social institutions are internal security forces like the KGB, the FBI, Savak, La Paz, Gestapo, or elements of the criminal justice system, or semi and uh, semi-official and unofficial organizations such as death squads, or large profit-maximizing organizations. Hierarchy attenuating institutions, it would be things like civil rights and civil liberties, organizations, charities, public defender's office, etc. Now I have four major goals with this talk. The first one is to argue that intergroup violence and terror are normal parts of intergroup discourse, in part designed to maintain group-based social inequality and dominant systems. Second, I'm going to try to argue that under normal circumstances, this intergroup violence and terror are not only carried out by individuals, 
but also by social institutions such as the criminal justice system and the internal security systems. Three, but I try to argue that group-based social hierarchy is in part established and maintained by the matching of individuals' hierarchical predispositions with the hierarchical functions of given social roles and institutions. And fourth and lastly, I'm going to try to suggest there are at least four mechanisms which match up individuals with certain kinds of proclivities to inst social institutions with certain kinds of roles and functions. Now I'm going to argue and suggest that in almost all societies, or complex societies, we can in part think of the criminal justice system as a form of institutional terror. Keeping in mind that the state in all societies is disproportionately controlled by members of dominant groups, Therefore, we can regard the violence exercised by the state, including the criminal justice system, as a form of group-based aggression of one group against the other, of dominance against subordinates, as a form of intergroup terror. And by the use of the term terror, I'm not just engaging in hyperbole, although I am in part doing that. Right? <laughs> But I'm really quite serious about it. That is to say, if we look in the American Heritage Dictionary, we can see that terror is defined as violence committed or threatened by a group to intimidate and coerce a population as for military and political purposes. And the political purposes I have in mind is the maintenance of social hierarchy. But one of the forms that this terror takes is in the uh, meeting out of the death penalty. And one of the things I've done in our research is look at a very interesting data file called the ESPI file, which looks at about 13,923 uh, death sentences carried out in the United States between 1608 and 1991. And one of the things that you can do with this database it's described how, who was killed, the race of the person who was executed, and how they were executed. And so we looked back at uh, these executions and were able to classify the means by which people were executed into three categories. Relatively humane executions, such as asphyxiation, shooting, and lethal injection, <coughs> moderately brutal forms of execution, hanging and electrocution. Electrocution in very brutal forms, crushing on the wheel, burning, hanging in chains, and bludgeoning. And we argued that these forms of uh, brutality or execution forms would be disproportionately uh, allocated to subordinate groups rather than dominant groups. So if we just take the groups of blacks and whites, we would expect that African Americans were more likely to be executed in brutal manners as opposed to whites. And looking at the data from this SB file, we in fact see data which is consistent with that expectation. That is to say, of those who are executed with relatively humane processes, 61% of those executed were white, 39% black. With the moderately brutal, it's about 50-50. And with the extremely brutal forms, it's 88 to 12, approximately. And we can see these acts of lynching and extreme forms of violence, among other things that they are, as a form of hierarchy maintenance strategies. 